awesome song. I'm sorry for the technical problems that you may or may not be experiencing. We're trying to work it out, but you know, if you just closed your eyes during the song and listened to the words, it was well worth it. So join us now as we sing our next song. Hopefully we will not have any problems, but I make no guarantees. So if you can't, if the words don't come up right, close your eyes and listen if you can't sing along. Take much for this virus to rear its head again. 
So as we come together and as we're able to come into churches, as we're able to go to stores, you know, do what you have to to protect yourself and keep yourself safe and keep others safe from you. Uh, I've said it every week, pray for common sense for our leaders and for us as individuals. Another praise that I just thought about, I mentioned earlier, is for the weather we've had this week. It is so good, and I don't know about the rest of you, but when the sun is shining, I feel a whole lot better. Uh, you know, we've had so much rain lately, I think I was beginning to start getting moss on my back. So, Anyway, why don't we go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we come before you this morning with thanksgiving and joy in our hearts. We're, thanks, we're thankful and we're joyful when we think about the weather that's outside and how, what a difference sunshine makes. But Lord, we're also even more joyful when we think what a difference the sun makes. The Son of God. Lord, I am so grateful that I know Jesus is Lord and Savior. And I am so grateful that so many people listening to my voice this morning know Him also. Father, I am also grateful that so many people, whether they know Him as Lord and Savior or not, so many people have the opportunity to come to know Him, to come to know, call on the name of Jesus Christ. And Father, my prayer is that many people would call on that name. Father, I thank you for the good news about Charlie and Linda both as they were in, they were both in the hospitals. Father, I pray that, that their recovery, uh, Charlie's recovery would be swift. Linda's uh, diagnoses and different things that she has to talk to the doctors about would, would just be good. Father, I pray for other people who are in the hospital who need a touch, who have been touched. Father, I ask you for Frank Morazic uh, this week as he prepares for surgery. I ask that you'd go with him. Uh, your word says that wherever we go, you're there also. You're there waiting for us. Father, I pray that Frank would latch on to that and know that you are in, in that operating room already waiting for him. Father, I ask for your continued goodness to Carl and Jean and my friend Bonnie and Charlie and Marion Brown and so many others who need a touch in their body, who need to be strengthened and lifted up, Lord. Father, you are the God of all comfort, the God of all peace, and we thank you, Lord. We thank you. And Father, as I often pray, I pray for those people who have needs that are too important or too personal to bring before you, or maybe they think they're too insignificant. Father, I don't believe there's any need that we might have that is so insignificant that you don't want to hear it. And Father, I pray that those people would open their hearts and their minds to you right now, open their mouths to you, and they would just come to you, Lord, and seek, seek your face and find you and find your healing touch. And Father, I pray as I prayed for the past few weeks for wisdom and discernment and common sense among our elected officials, among our population, Lord, as we consider the reopening of this country. It's hard to think that we'd ever say something like reopening the country, but that's what we're doing. Father, I pray for wisdom. I pray that we do it smart. And we, we would not be foolish in the things we do. Father, I, I, I just pray for your hand of protection upon the church. I pray your hand of protection upon this country. And Father, I pray that as a country, we would collectively get down on our knees and thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you're going to do. And ask you, Lord, to bless us and keep us. Father, I thank you for this time we can get together in your house, whether it's over the airwaves or whether we're physically together in the house, I thank you, Lord, that we have the ability to meet and come together. And Lord, we give you all the praise, the honor, and the glory in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. At this time, our scripture for today is found in 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verses 6 through 9. And Valerie's going to read it for me this, this morning. At the king's command, runners were sent throughout Israel and Judah. They carried letters that said, O people of Israel, return to the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, so that he will return to the few of us who have survived the conquest of the Assyrian kings. Do not be like your ancestors and their relatives who abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors, and became an object of derision as you yourselves can see. Do not be stubborn as they were, but submit yourselves to the Lord. Come to his temple, which he has set apart as holy forever. Worship the Lord your God, so that his fierce anger will turn away from you. For if you return to the Lord, your relatives and your children will be treated mercifully by their captors, and they will be able to return to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful, 
If you return to him, he will not continue to turn his face from you. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would take the reading of your word, your most holy, precious word to us, Lord, and that you use it to encourage us, strengthen us, and build us up. Father, I thank you that you've given us your word to live by, your word to learn, your word to strengthen. And for Lord, now I just ask that you would use it to encourage us. I pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you were here last week, you know that I started out, and I was talking at least in part when I started about the Chinese church, the underground church in China, especially at the time of the Communist Revolution, when they first seized power, and the church had to go underground. They didn't have a choice but to go underground. And at that time, the church, when the rulers thought it would perish, actually prospered and flourished. And it still is flourishing to this day. And one of the reasons it's flourishing is because the early Christians during this time came up with a statement, and the statement was simply, Jesus is my Lord, and I will cling to him. Well, I went on to tell you that I personally think that if we, the church in America, the church as a whole, the church as large, if we, at large, if we would truly embrace the simple statement, our lives would be a whole lot better. If you remember, I said that part of our clinging to Christ involves purposely keeping our eyes focused on Him. Because the truth is that if we will keep our eyes, our hearts, our minds focused on Him and not on the distractions that are going on around us, He will get us through to the other side. The other side being life eternal, the other side being heaven, the other side being with Jesus. But you know, if we're going to truly do this, if we're going to truly cling to Him, there's something else involved in clinging also. If we are going to truly cling to Him, it's going to involve submission on our parts. And I wonder if that isn't where so many of us have a problem. You know, many of us can say, I, I can cling to Jesus, I can follow Jesus, I can even keep my eyes on Jesus. But really, Pastor? Submit totally and completely to Him? Well, that's just another story, isn't it? But think about it. I wonder, have you ever thought, found yourself thinking or saying something even remotely like that? Or something like this, I can hang on to Jesus, I can follow Jesus, I can even cling to Jesus, as long as I can do it my way. Now, maybe you don't want to admit that, but... Most of us do say that at some time or another. Many of us could talk about lives spent clinging to Christ, yet over and over we find ourselves bogged down, mainly because we choose to let go and not cling to and go where He would take us. We want to go where we want to go. We want to cling to Christ, but only if we can maintain the control. Sometimes it seems that we often cannot get out of our own way. Or have the victory over some area of sin in our lives. And yes, it seems that we keep, we keep trying, but we keep falling back. And I wonder if that could be because we have not yet learned to be totally submissive to God through Christ Jesus. Think about it. Last week, I wonder if how many of you had a chuckle when I used the example of following me to Long Island. I said that you became lost because you did not follow closely enough. But doesn't your follow me, if you were going to follow me to Long Island, doesn't that implicitly imply that you'll also submit to me into whatever route I choose, however I want to go? Now before we left, I may have told you that we were going to go down I-81 to Route 17 towards New York City. But somewhere between here and Route 17, I decided that we were going to go a different way. Maybe you didn't know, I got a phone call from my friend and told me there was a terrific auto accident on, on Route 17, you don't want to go that way. Or maybe I just had a change of plans and decided it would be a more scenic route to go down Route 81 to Route 80 and cut across Pennsylvania into New York City. But you were following me, you were behind me, you were following closely, paying attention to where I was going. But when I got to that cutoff where we should have gone left or east on Route 17, I went straight and you said, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's not what he said. He's changed the course. I'm going to go my own way. 
I know better than him. So you went down to 17 instead of following me. And once you're on 17, by the way, you ran into that horrific auto accident, and you were there for hours, and then when you finally got out of your auto accident, you were lost, because I never told you what to do after you were on Route 17. The bottom line is that when you said you'd follow me to Long Island, you did say tacitly or implied that you would submit to my leading. Well, I think it's the same thing with clinging to Jesus. Once we make the decision to cling to, to focus on, to follow Him, we also must give up control and submit ourselves directly to Him. I know I've told you about my children, how they would wrap their arms around my legs and sit on my feet, and most of us who are fathers, even moms, have experienced that with the kids. They would literally cling to you. But when they did, they put themselves in submission to where I wanted to go. They didn't have control anymore. And again, I think that's where too many of us have a problem. Following, focus, even clinging to him are the easy parts. But submission? Submission? And yet submission is exactly what we have to do. The time I have left this morning, I'd like to look at several scriptural references concerning submission. But before I do, I just want to give you a definition of the word. Whenever we read the word submission in the New Testament, or the word submit, it's often talking about being subject to or being placed under another's authority. <coughs> Excuse me. If we looked in the dictionary, we'd find along with other definitions, we would find to surrender, to yield oneself to another or another's authority. When I think about submission, some of the synonyms that I come up with that come to my mind is humility, meekness, obedience. Bottom line is, submission to God involves giving up your own right to self. I have often heard this quip, and I'm, this quip, and I'm sure you have also. There's a right way, there's a wrong way, and there's so-and-so's way. But you know, the truth is that God's way, unlike our way, will never be the wrong way. His way will always be the right way. In the book of Jeremiah, the Old Testament book, we read that God has said, said this through the prophet Jeremiah. He said, I know the plans I have for you. The pl they are plans for, a good, for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope, Jeremiah 29, 11. Think about it. In the example of following me, you agree to submit to my authority. You gave up, even if only temporarily, your right to, to set the directions. And that's what we do when we submit to God through his son, Jesus Christ. When we cling to the Lord, we're saying that we trust him to get us through this journey on earth. It begins by submitting, submitting to him and dying to self. We have to be ready, willing, and able to subject ourselves to God and to his will rather than to our own. <coughs> Excuse me, and for so many of us, that's a hard thing. That's a hard thing. But Jesus, I love reading scripture and I love Christ, especially in scripture, because he always gives us an example of what submission is, what perfect submission is. We find it in the garden in Gethsemane, just before his crucifixion, just before he was arrested. He's in the garden, Matthew 26, 39, and he cries out, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken from me. Yet I want your will and not mine. Can you imagine that? Jesus, the Son of God, God the Son, submitted to God the Father. Well, if he could do that, what makes us think we don't have to? In the book of James, yeah, the Apostle James tells us, Submit yourselves to God. Humble yourselves before the Lord. That's James chapter 4, verse 7 and 10. That's for the New International Version. But the New Living Translation simply says, Humble yourselves before God. When you bow down before the Lord and admit your dependence on Him, He will lift you up and give you honor. Or maybe Eugene Peterson in his paraphrase the message where he says it like this. So let God work His will in you. The fun and games are over. Get serious. Really serious. Get down on your knees before the Master. It's the only way you'll get on your feet. Bottom line, let God be God. For too long we've heard and listened to all self-help gurus. For too long we've heard that we can and should pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. 
And to some extent, we may be able to have a measure of success, but as Christians, we need to live a life that's in submission to God. And the problem we have is not just being human, but being humans who happen to live in America. And as such, we chafe at the bit. As Americans would, would found to say, you want me to do what? You might want me to bow down to who? You want me to be humble? You want me to submit? You want me to go along with your authority? What are you, crazy? I know I've heard, and maybe you heard it too, someone say, maybe you've even said it yourself, I bow down to no one. Listen, the truth is that one day, one day, and I don't think it's in a too distant future, every knee will bow down and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord, whether we want to or not. And that's not my words. That's in Romans chapter 14, verse 11. It says, As surely as I live, the Lord says the Lord, every knee will bow before me and every tongue will confess that I am God. Now here's a little aside. See, it isn't even in my notes. But I'd rather bend my knee now than have my knee bent for me, which is what's going to happen in that day. One of our problems, I believe, is that we want to have it all. We want to have all that the world has to offer, while at the same time, we want to have all that God has to offer to us. I would suggest that we can't do both. And again, I'm basing it on Scripture, because in Luke chapter 16, verse 13, Jesus said, No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. <coughs> Excuse me. And yet we do try, don't we? Listen to what James told his readers in the verses that are immediately precede the one I just read. If your aim is to enjoy this world, you can't be a friend of God's. That's pretty stiff, isn't it? Peterson, I think, says it a little different in the message. If all you want is your own way, flirting with the world every chance you get, you end up enemies of God in his way. And do you suppose God doesn't care? The proverb has it, he's a fiercely jealous lover. And what he gives in love is far better than anything you'll find. It's common knowledge that God goes against the willful, the willfully proud. Gives, God gives grace to the humble. Did you get that? God gives grace to the humble. When we finally come to a place of submission and humility before God, it causes us to, causes us to refocus on this message of grace. When we get there is when we realize that it's not about us. Did you get that? It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about us. It's about God. It isn't about what we can do, what you can do, what I can do. It's about what God does do. He, God, pours out His grace upon us. He heals us. He forgives us. He enables us to do His will. He promises His eternity. He forgives our sins. He does all of this. If we will submit ourselves to Him and His will, He will lift us up. Scripture says He will lift you up and give you honor. He will get you on your feet. One of our problems is we spend so much striving to be the best. We strive to be the best father, the best mother, the best husband, the best wife, the best student, the best anything. The best church, the best worker. You name it. We want to be the best. But if we really want to be the best where it counts most, then we must submit ourselves to God and to His direct. Not only that, Scripture tells us that if we will submit to God, we will live. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 9, verse 9 says, Moreover, we have all, let's try that again, Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? <coughs> You know, when I first read that particular passage, I find myself arguing with it. And I don't know if you've ever argued with Scripture. I know I have. I said, really? No, that can't be right. This isn't. But I found myself arguing with it, especially when it talked about submitting to the Father. Now, some of you may know, some of you may not, and it may come as a shock to you. My parents were divorced when I was young. I was about 10 years old. I don't have so many great memories, because after 10, I think I've seen my father once in the past 50 years, 60 years. But that's not what I'm talking about. But one of my memories of my father, and I have to admit it was a bleak memory, and this is why I have a problem with that verse. I was young, someplace between 6 and 10, I guess, I don't know. 
We were visiting my grandparents who lived on the other side of town. I remember I had a bicycle. I might have had training wheels at the time, so I was probably, probably about five or six. And my dad came up and told me, he said, you can go ride on the sidewalk. We had sidewalks where we lived. We had blocks. And he said, you can ride on the sidewalk. I was told I could ride up and down the sidewalk. Up and down the sidewalk. Don't cross the street. Don't get lost up and down the sidewalk. Don't leave the block. So being the totally obedient child that I was, I did just that for a little while. But then, even at an early age, self took over. Now, I have to tell you, I've always been a person who tried to obey the letter of the law while ignoring what I knew was the intent. I don't know if anybody else has had that problem, but I have. I always tried to find a way to bend the law and do what I want while technically being obedient. I reasoned that my father said, don't leave the sidewalk, don't cross the street, so I took it on myself to ride around the whole block. I was still on the sidewalk. I didn't cross the street. I just extended my ride. I have to admit, before you, before God, even before my father, that I knew what he really meant. He was clear on his direction, but I decided to reinterpret his directions. I might have been able to say that I really did not disobey, even though I know I did. And when my father found me, I was chastised severely. And I won't tell you what the punishment was, but in my little mind, it did not fit the crime. But I was punished. And it has taken me up until recently to realize that while I did not agree with the method of punishment, or the punishment, as I read this, I came to re read this about God, I came to realize it was done so that I might live. I don't believe my father was intent on, on hurting me, or physically abusing me. I don't believe that. I don't believe that at all. He wanted me to be saved from dangers that I had no idea existed. He wanted me to be in a position that if he looked out on the sidewalk, he could see where I was and what I was doing. And as we come into suspicion to God, there will be times that we have to bow to his authority to acknowledge that he really does know best. And that in the end, we will live. Jesus cried out to God in that. Jesus cried out to God to take away the agony of the cross but at the same time kept himself in submission to God. Because he was obedient, obedient even to death, God gave him life. And the truth is, if we will submit to God, we too will have life. We've deluded ourselves that the only way we can truly have a satisfying and fulfilling life is to do it our own way. The truth is, the only way we'll ever really have life is to set Jesus up as Lord and Savior. Jesus is quoted as saying, I came so they could have real and eternal life, more and better than they ever dreamed of in John 10.10. 10. But the only way we, can really, we will ever really experience that life is to live a life of submission to God. So, what does it mean to us to live a life of submission? Are we to walk, walk bent over in fear with our eyes glued on the ground? Should we be like that little puppy that curls up in submission and whines every time the master speaks, cowering in fear? Or maybe we should be like that puppy that comes running at the sound of his master's voice, knowing that the master loves him and is going to reward him. I believe the latter is the one we should seek to emulate or copy. I believe that submission to God does not mean a subservient life. Rather, I think it means a life lived to the fullest. Longing to please God who is forgiving us. Longing to walk with God who has showered us with his undeserved, unmerited grace and compassion. Jesus came, not so we could have an army of mindless, robotic, bent over servants. He came so we could really experience the life. But that life is only attainable if we will submit, surrender, surrender humble ourselves, and obey him. I want each one of you to know and experience that real life in Christ. But first you have to make him Lord of your life. And the bottom line, and I'll end with this. The bottom line is if we will cling to him, if we will submit ourselves to him, then he will transform us. And we'll have a new life in Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. 
I thank you, Lord, because you don't want mindless robots. You don't want bent over servants. You want people who love you, who worship you, who adore you. You want people who listen to you and obey you. Father, I pray that we become that people that truly obey you, truly listen to you, and truly do what you would have us do. Father, I pray we'd be a people that would truly surrender our lives to you. Father, I ask it in Christ's name. Amen. As we close with our last song, I believe it's a fitting song, it's I Surrender All. until we come together again. And Lord, we will give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>